If you've diagnosed a fungal infection in your patient, perhaps oral thrush or a denture stomatitis, should you prescribe antifungals straight away or is it a good idea to improve the oral hygiene, the denture hygiene first? Should you always be sending for a blood test or is it okay just to go straight for the antifungals? Look, if you're anything like me and every time you even suspect fungal infection in your patient, you're thinking, whoa, where do I even begin? What do I prescribe? I haven't done this in ages because you see, this is something that unlike a lot of other things in dental school, this is probably actually taught well. But the frequency of how often you actually see patients with fungal infections is not very common. Therefore, we kind of forget what is the best to prescribe at the best time. So unless you've done it a few times, you're probably going to gain a lot from this episode like I did with our guest, oral medicine specialist, Dr. Amanda Nguyen from Perth, Australia. Now, Patrice Rati, I know you're going to love Amanda because she is so straight talking. I know you love our straight talking guests and she is just absolutely brilliant. We have a fantastic infographic for you to download as well and a lovely episode summary for you to sink your teeth into. Hello, Patrice Rati. I'm Jazz Galati and welcome back to another episode of Protrusive Dental Podcast. If you're new to the podcast, hello. Thanks for joining us on this oral medicine topic. Very rare for an oral medicine podcast. Perhaps we should do more. I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you think I should be doing more of these. It's maybe not as sexy as composites and adhesion, but it's bloody well important, isn't it? Every episode, I give you a protrusive dental pearl, and today is like a philosophical, motivational one. If there's something in your life that you've been holding off, that you've been putting off, right? This could be like adding meditation to your life. This could be exercise. This could be improving your diet. This could be something business-related, something or even work-related, a habit that you want to pick up. Remember that the best time to do it was some years ago, right? The best time to do it was some years ago. But you know what? The second best time is today. And I'm saying this, even if it helps one person, then this protrusive dental pearl was well worth it, right? So if there's something they've been holding it off, what are you waiting for, right? Today is the best day. Yesterday was a better day, but that's not going to happen. So why not do it today? Why not write down right now, write on a piece of paper, write on one of those apps, write on Google Docs, WhatsApp someone, voice note your spouse, what it is that you're going to do starting from today that you should have started yesterday or many years ago, but today is a damn good day to do it. So you go ahead and do it. And if you want to message me on Instagram to let me know what that thing was, at Protrusive Dental, I'd like to hear. It'd be cool. Anyway, I'll catch you in the outro. Enjoy this episode. Now, there's a lot going on, right? You'll get lots of helpful advice about what to prescribe, the different conditions. So it's going to lend itself, like I said, very well to the notes and the infographic. And I'll let you know how to get your hands on those, but I'll catch you in the outro. Dr. Amanda Poon Nguyen, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. I'm stoked to have an oral medicine guest finally on the podcast. This will be some uh, new stuff for the Patricia Rati and something that's really relevant for all general dentists. Now, before we dive into antifungals, what to look for, what to prescribe, just tell us about yourself. Why did you fall in love with oral medicine? How bizarre is that? You know, to be honest, when I was going through dental school, I... A, didn't think I would ever specialize. I thought, like, why would anyone ever want to narrow themselves to one field? But then I think as I became a dentist and I had more and more experience, I actually found general dentistry quite overwhelming because there was so much to know about so much. And then I started to think about specializing. I did some further study. And the two that I actually was very interested in was pediatric dentistry because I quite enjoyed, like, treating kids. And then oral medicine. And in the end, um, oral medicine won out and I've been an oral medicine specialist for a while now and I love it. Um, I think the bit that is so interesting about oral medicine um, is that every patient that walks through the door is something different. Like there's a lot of like differential diagnoses, diagnostic sieve, trying to put together like puzzle pieces almost to get to the right diagnosis and treatment plan. And I think that is what I find, you know, the best part about oral medicine is that it's so interesting. It reminds me of, I, I treat a lot of TMD, uh, yeah. and the more I read about TMD, TMD is a thinker's game, right? It's yes. very much a thinker's game. And oral medicine is very much a thinker's game. And just like you said, like, yes, you do lots of investigations as a general dentist, but general dentistry, you're getting your handpiece out, you're doing something. Whereas you're working with your mind and really trying to nail that diagnosis, which sometimes probably can be one of those challenging parts, I imagine. Yes, I think so. So um, sometimes... Um, you know, when I talk about oral medicine or I speak to people about oral medicine, sometimes even with patients, there's very much a tendency to jump into how do we manage this. But actually, the the main goal is to actually get the right diagnosis first. And I think that's where a lot of the um, art and science of oral medicine comes into play. Well, in the UK, Amanda, I'm, I, I might be wrong, but I, I think in the UK, you have to do medicine. You have to be duly qualified to then become an oral medicine specialist. Is that, is that the case in Australia as well? 
Yes. So in the UK, um, you had to be dually qualified, I think, until very recently. Um, and in oral medicine uh, in Australia, it's a dental specialization. In oral medicine, I think you have to be dual qualified. So there's a couple of uh, places that are still dual qualified, but most places now are moving towards singly qualified. Fine. Uh, and so the topic, I mean, there's so much we could talk about in, in oral medicine, but just a little bit more about you. Uh, where do you actually practice? You Are you in a hospital setting? Are you in a private practice setting? How does it work there? Yes, so I work in a bunch of different places, actually, because I quite like the variety. Um, So I work in private practice three to four days a week, and then I am at the university. So I'm an adjunct senior lecturer uh, at the University of Western Australia, and I also have a consultant's position at the Perth Children's Hospital. So I do a mix of public and private. Brilliant, brilliant. So it keeps you busy, very busy, it seems. So amazing. Well, thanks for making time for this podcast episode on fungal infections and antifungals. So we could start anywhere now you can i'm gonna help get your advice on terms of the which is the best way to uh, lead the show but one idea i had was to break it down in terms of sometimes patients come in without any uh, symptoms and it's the signs that we spot and then sometimes they come in with symptoms which helps us i think the best way to start would be perhaps the symptomatic patient who's prompting us oh, i have an issue with my tongue oh i've got some white flecks or, or whatever and then it's up to us and use that that information the symptoms and the signs to come up with a diagnosis and then we can get our prescription pad out. So maybe the first half, let's talk about diagnosis, signs, symptoms, diagnoses, and then we can talk about the management. So perhaps you can tell us what are the most common fungal issues that a dentist might encounter and how to even begin diagnosing them. Yeah, so fungal infections is a very broad category of infections that may occur in the oral cavity. By far and large, the most common causative organism is candida. So that's that's a group of yeast. So candida albicans is actually the one that is most commonly implicated. And the reason why I'm sort of bringing that up is that we, we can't look at it as, as, a, as a broad thing. We need to think about, are we just talking about candidosis, which in this case we are, because there's a bunch of other infections that can occur in the mouth that are fungally caused. But the one that a general dentist or that a dentist would most commonly see would be one that was caused by by oral candida, um, that it's caused by candida. Um, actually, this brings me to to my first point. Do you call it candidiasis or candidosis? Because in Australia, we some people say candidiasis. I think it should be candidosis. Um, and I think sometimes getting getting that out of the way is probably the, the best thing first. What do you guys do over there? From my lectures in Sheffield, we had candidosis. Very good. So I say candidosis too, because that is more in line with all the other fungal infections which actually end with oasis. So uh, candidiasis kind of doesn't make too much sense. But anyway, so let's say we're talking about oral candidosis. Um, It's important to recognize also that it is actually a commensural. So if you look at the studies, it exists on us um, in a large percentage. So between 40 and 80% of people actually have candida on them already. And then some of the newer studies can say that it is as high as 100%. So when we're talking about candidosis, is it actually the presence of the fungus that we are concerned about? Does that actually need treating? Or is it actually when it becomes an infection and causes a problem and that's when we should treat it? And that will come down to how we actually diagnose it. So first of all, looking at clinical signs and symptoms, I think it's fairly reasonable to diagnose based on a clinical appearance. And that is what I would do most of the time. So when we talk about primary oral candidosis, we can have the pseudomembranous candidosis, chronic hyperplastic candidosis, and erythematous candidosis. Now, a pseudomembranous candidosis is the easiest one to recognize. Pardon this if you're having your dinner or if you're listening to this while you're eating. It looks like cottage cheese in the mouth, basically, <laughs> right? So you look at it, it looks like cottage cheese. Now, when I tell people about doing a head and neck examination, I always talk about palpating and feeding lesions as well. So the first thing you should do if you see cream cheese in the mouth or cottage cheese in the mouth, give it a little bit of a wipe. Is it food debris? Um, in infants, it's very common. Sometimes they have milk debris as well and people start to worry, is that actually candidosis. So give it a little bit of a white first. See what is left behind. If there is a very erythematous base behind, then you probably do have pseudomembranous candidosis. Do you need to do any additional testing to diagnose it? I don't really think so. So in most cases, if that is what I see, that looks like pseudomembranous candidosis, and I would, I would proceed to treat that. 
Now, the other ones that we talked about, chronic hyperplastic candidosis, actually looks a lot like leukoplakia. So it can be non-homogenous or homogenous. It's basically a white patch in the oral cavity. Most common locations, buccal commissures, ventral tongue. Now, if you see a white patch that cannot be wiped away and you don't really know what it is and you don't think that it is related to trauma, I think that should be further investigated. There are some studies out there that show that uh, upon biopsy, chronic hyperplastic uh, candidosis lesions have a higher degree of dysplasia and things like that. So I think those ones should be treated with suspicion and you may want to consider maybe referring it to someone who could manage the patient long term if it does turn out to be dysplastic. Erythematous candidosis. So so, so Mm. pseudomembranous, which is the cottage cheese one, and the chronic hyperplastic, they can both be wiped away. Is that correct, yeah? Uh, No. So chronic hyperplastic cannot be wiped away, but pseudomembranous can. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then erythematous candidosis, which is the other one, you can get the acute or chronic forms of it. But the first thing that I do when I look in a patient's mouth is very red. Acute erythematous candidosis is actually usually painful. And actually, it's usually most associated with someone who has recently been on a broad spectrum antibiotic. So if they've been on antibiotic, their mouth is suddenly red and pretty painful, um, I will be happy to treat that as well as candidosis. So I think candidosis, there are a lot of different presentations. But if it's a fairly classical form and it fits, I think having a clinical diagnosis and a considering management, um, I think is adequate. Where we would do like further investigations like biopsies or swabs or things like that, I think the role... Or blood tests even? Or blood tests even, yeah. So I think the role for that comes... So blood tests is more to see if there's an underlying systemic contributor. So that's so we can talk about that when we come into management. Mm-hmm. But say mm-hmm. if you see a patient with all of these clinical signs and symptoms, and you and you think that it is oral candidosis, um, I think it is reasonable to go ahead and manage the patient, and we can talk about management. But, but, and but sounds like the second one, the chronic mm. hyperplastic, sounds like the advice here is because it is a patch that can't be rubbed away. That uh, as a general dentist, perhaps you're good, you're, you're correct to refer. Yeah. As a yeah. rule of thumb. Yeah, that's it. So okay. because chronic hyperplastic candidosis, I would say that most people will not be able to differentiate it from a leukoplakia just by looking at it. So I think in this case, when I say you can go ahead and treat, I will be thinking more about the erythematous candidosis or the pseudomembranous candidosis, because Very like realistically, if you see a white patch on the side of the tongue, on the ventral mm-hmm. surface of the tongue that doesn't wipe away, patient doesn't know how long it's been there, that's pretty much a referral, I think, in most Australian dental professional books. As a, as a general dentist and restorative dentist, I, I, I treat patients with their denture stomatitis mm-hmm. and that is uh, often linked to uh, fungal infections candida now mm-hmm. does that fall into either of those categories or is that an entirely new category yes that's an excellent question so the th- so the three that we just talked about there pseudomembranous chronic hyperplastic and erythematous candidosis they are your primary oral candidosis now you do have candida associated lesions which is a different category and the reason why there is a different category of these um, of which denture stomatitis fits into there is is that it is usually thought to be a polymicrobial infection. So not only related to candida, or the evidence isn't strong that candida is the only causative factor. So those ones would be your angular colitis, and we can talk about that because that's very common. A lot of people have that. Um, medium rhomboid glossitis, where you have a depapillated area in the dorsal surface of the tongue, looks a little bit like a diamond. And then you have sometimes called, something called linear gingival erythema, where you get basically a red band along the interdental papilla. Now, if you do see a patient with linear gingival erythema, not to say that it doesn't happen in people who don't have an underlying medical problem, but it's seen in a lot higher numbers in people who do have HIV. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, and then the dentistal stomatitis. But that must be so difficult to diagnose, Amanda, because it just, you might think that that's just gingivitis. Yes. So the hallmark feature of that actually is something that is not responsive to plaque management. So if you see a patient and you think that they've got gingivitis, you do plaque control, you do debridement, scale and cleans, you uh, increase the oral hygiene, but it still remains. And I think that's when it's worthwhile considering referral either to an oral medicine or a periodontist. Okay, so if you're enjoying this episode and you know about the different conditions and we're going to get into what to prescribe, and if you want it all nicely and neatly presented to you in an infographic so it's easy for you to know what to prescribe when and the different diagnoses, like a cheat sheet, right? An antifungal dentistry cheat sheet that you wish dental school had given to you or you wish was in a textbook somewhere, but don't worry, I got you covered. If you want this, you head over to protrusive.co.uk forward slash antifungals. That's protrusive.co.uk forward slash antifungals. And I will email it to you personally, right? So back to the episode.
Mm. Got it. So in terms of you break it up, because uh, now we're branching into two areas, let's mm. finish up and wrap up the, the, the first part, the three primary diagnoses you make. Yeah. Uh, and we talk about their management before we talk about the denture and the angular colitis, which I think I'd like to because it's just so common that we see it actually. Yes. Yes. So with all of the candidal presentations, if you suspect a fungal infection, and we've talked about how the most likely ones that you will probably suspect is the pseudomembranous and the erythematous candidosis, um, the general treatment will be with via an antifungal medication. And there are different types of antifungal medications that we can consider for patients. Equally as important as starting your patient on these medications is considering what other modifiable factors there are. Because we've talked about how candida is something that is present in a large percentage of patients, there is something that has changed. So something in the environment that has changed or something in the host factor that has changed that has caused the candida to become more active and more invasive and basically start to cause a problem. So classic things would be, you know, has, have they recently started a new medication? Have they recently got a denture? Have they recently changed their diet? If they do have things like diabetes and stuff that stuff like that, it's always worthwhile, I think, to ask the patient, you know, how because we, we see lots of patients with diabetes. How well controlled is it? When did you last check? Are they checking themselves at home? Did their doctors check it? How their denture hygiene is as well? I mean, it's not uncommon that I have patients come to see me with these types of candidal infections, but they are not aware of denture hygiene or they have been told, but they just don't listen to it. So reinforcing all of that's important. If they have anemia, that's a pretty common one as well. So that's where the blood test would come in. So if I see a patient and they have a history of, you know, anemia or anything like that or if they're sometimes they're female or they've been a bit run down I would generally do a general blood screen so I would do a full blood count I would do vitamin b12 folate and iron studies because these are the things that sometimes are well that are used for mucosal healing so if there's any sort of deficiency in them there's a defect in the mucosa and that's how Canada can sometimes be a little bit more active as well we don't see this as much as anymore but back to dental school days up to the people who are listening you might remember like hearing about red beefy tongue where the tongue looks very red and very smooth and things like that so if you see any of those sort of signs I think it's a good idea to investigate what's underlying it because what about dry mouth serostomia is that a, a, a cause as well Definitely, yeah. So that would be one of the things that can alter the um, the is is a host factor that has altered. Um, so I think paying attention to all of these factors is quite important as well. Steroid puffers as well. If you do have patients that are using steroid asthma puffers, reminding them that they should rinse their mouth out after using it is also important because sometimes they sort of were told by their dentist or they read it on the packet, but then they forgot all about it and they're wondering why they're getting this, you know, this candidal infection in their mouth. So I think spending a little bit of time seeing if the patient's systemically well, if anything has changed, oral appliance-wise, checking their saliva, you know, checking the control of their systemic condition. I think it's 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 basically really important because in the past Canada used to be called like you know the diseased of the diseased. That's that's actually what they used to mm. call it. So mm-hmm. you know that's like the hallmark sign. Like you've got to check out if anything else is going on. If they are immunocompromised, if they're on long-term corticosteroids, that's another one as well. Um, see if maybe that is something that they are are doing if they recently had antibiotics this is what i mean you mentioned antibiotics and you're Mm. quite right that's a common one but Mm. this this, what becomes difficult for the general dentist and one of the reasons Mm. i got you on is that you know you're a general dentist busy 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 list and suddenly you have to switch on your oral medicine hat on and become this investigator quite rightly so but this is where general dentists really struggle because you know you've got a a queue of waiting patients you just diagnosed Mm. fungal infection and now to do the entire medical history so exhaustively to figure out exactly what's changed the environment, that can be a tricky thing. So hopefully we're going to give you a few tips to, to make it uh, more efficient and better. So mm-hmm. two questions I have based on uh, all the wonderful said you said that is, let's talk about, let's talk about um, anemia being either suspected or in the medical history. Would you expect the general dentist to refer to oral medicine or to the GP to, to get bloods, you think? That is an excellent question. And you know, to be honest, I don't really know the answer. Like, okay, I... I know what my answer would be, but I don't think it is always correct. I think it depends on the patient's general practitioner because I've had multiple cases where the patient is sent to the doctor and the doctor hasn't really known what blood test to order or they're unsure about potential systemic contributors to oral candidosis and then the patient just ends up going round and round in circles for a little bit. I think this will have to be up to the person that is listening, to um, like whoever's listening to the podcast podcast to maybe have a chat with their patients about do they have a regular GP? Has their GP been 
been pretty thorough. Because a good GP, I think, would be uh, very adequate in managing this. But then at the same time, GPs are also very busy. So they need to know a little bit about everything. So it's sometimes very difficult to expect them to know how to manage oral candidosis systemic conditions. They may not know necessarily what to look for when they start to order blood tests. And then even then, they may not know what to prescribe. And actually, one really big thing that we've not really talked about as well is that I've set the cases where oral candidosis is very obvious, pseudomembranous candidosis being the example. But there are many times where these signs and symptoms are are sort of nebulous or not very obvious, and then the patients are misdiagnosed and they sort of go into a merry-go-round. So a classic example would be burning mouth syndrome, which is otherwise known as oral dysesthesia. I've recently just done a lecture on that as well, and I I looked at this paper that was done um, in Italy And the number of burning mouth syndrome cases that were misdiagnosed as oral candidosis is actually quite high. So, you know, would you necessarily expect a patient's GP to be able to know the differential diagnoses of oral burning or potential, you know, oral infections? I think that is really difficult as well um, because, you know, GPs are, are very busy, so they may not know. Are they always segregated, the burning? I mean, do you th- is there any evidence that uh, everyone with burning mouth syndrome has a candle infection at the same time or vice versa, the, 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 the candida is what set off the, the BMS? Is there anything linked or are they very much different entities? Yeah, so there have been a couple of studies to look at candidal carriage in people who do have burning mouth syndrome. But unfortunately, I don't think we can put much stock into that because candidal carriage is something that we know doesn't necessarily mean infection. So I think it's probably easier to think of it as being separate because burning mouth syndrome is meant to be a diagnosis of exclusion where we've ruled everything out, then we diagnose the patient with burning mouth syndrome. So if they do have signs of oral candidal infection, then we would diagnose them as having an oral candidal infection first and then see how they respond to management. And if we're sure that there's no longer a- any other infection or any other problem and we think it's budding, mal- like, you know, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, mm-hmm. essentially. So I think it's easier to think of it separately. Okay. Well, the second question I was going to ask then is, uh, let's say w- uh, we've looked for the signs and we've either diagnosed the cottage cheese appearance or the chronic hyoplastic when we get a referral out to get it investigated because of the risk of uh, dysplasia, or we've got the uh, erythematous one. And we, we, we from this podcast, we're thinking, okay, I think I've diagnosed a fungal infection. Now, Something has, as you said quite beautifully, something has changed in the host. And we're going to uh, discuss and have a chat with the patient, look at their medical history, take a close look. What is the recommended pathway? Is there a school of thought that actually we shouldn't pick up the referral pad? How about we listen to the patient, figure out what's changed uh, and try and uh, see if possible, if, if within our powers, we reverse that. Or should we also, um, we, should, we should prescribe antifungals and investigate what's changed. So uh, what I'm trying to say is a hands-off approach, no prescription, but let's just uh, drink more water, stay more hydrated, figure out what's causing the xerostomia, speak to your GP about changing that medicine, clean your denture better, and not giving the antifungals. Is there a a place for that? So I have to caveat this by saying that you have to um, look at the therapeutic guidelines of your own country where you're from, because uh, I know people from all around the world listen to this podcast. But what I would do in Australia is that with the people that I work with, I would actually encourage doing both. So if you have a reasonable suspicion that it is an oral fungal um, fungal infection, like oral candidosis, modify any risk factors that, that is possible or dentally related or talk to the patient's GP um, if there's anything there. Manage the patient with their oral fungal infection. And then if it doesn't get any better or something's a little bit unusual or if you think it is chronic hyperplastic, it's a leukoplakia, you don't know if it's leukoplakia or not, those ones I think you should refer. But if not, if it's a fungal infection, I think dentists should be able to manage that. And certainly I think it's a good idea because I'm sure in the UK as well and the same as same here in Australia um, the wait list for for an oral medicine specialist or you know like a specialist is quite long um, you don't necessarily need massive to yeah massive. And, and, and they're few and far between the oral medicine specialists only work in certain you know tertiary centers if you like so mm-hmm. um, usually mm-hmm. the, the only option we have is to refer to max fax which may which is similar but not the same mm-hmm. yeah no I agree so I think it I, I think general dentists or dental professionals are, are well within their capability um, to to manage this. And then if it's recalcitrant or anything's a little bit unusual, then I think that is worth a referral. 
Okay, brilliant. Well, let's talk about the medicines, I guess, the, the, mm. the management uh, as a general dentist that is uh, accepted before we then talk about the uh, angular colitis and median yes. rhomboglottitis. Yeah, so please tell us. Yes, so there are different types of antifungals. So the earlier ones are actually the polines, which is the nystatin and the amphotericin. Now, nystatin in Australia comes in a nilstat oral drop form. And I think when I looked it up online, what they had it in the UK, I think it comes in a suspension. Uh, some places may have it in pastilles. Nystatin is something that has been shown to be not particularly effective in the oral cavity. Now, obviously, the efficacy depends on which formulation you're using but in general they're not they're not amazing uh, in Australia it is a little bit of an issue because that seems to be very widely prescribed and I, I don't know why the most weak one is is the most commonly prescribed probably for ease of use but the problem with the nails that oral drops or the suspensions is that we have issues with making sure that they stay in the mouth for long enough because if it's an oral drop or suspension it kind of doesn't really hang in there that much and also it doesn't taste very nice or you know in some formulations they don't taste very nice and it actually increases salivation and which further dilutes the nystatin so i think a nystatin is probably one that i wouldn't recommend because it's not particularly effective unless for some reason you decide to get it compounded at a compound chemist and they can do different things like different suspensions different coating agents to make it stay in the oral cavity a little bit longer but why would you do that when there are other things so the most common one would be myconazole oral gel the brand name here in australia is dectarin oral gel um that yes, is same yes yeah so that's pretty easy to find um you can get it from the pharmacy and then that is what i would get patients to apply in their mouth four times daily for about four weeks it is generally well tolerated um there are a few significant interactions which we will get into that um, i think people should should be aware about but in general it's can you just describe to the general dentist uh, um when they're mm -hmm. uh, explaining to their patients maybe the first time they're prescribing this um yep. and and yes, you can read it, but how should they instruct their yes. patients to wear it? Yep. And how might it differ if the patient's got a denture? Yes. So I get this question all the time. So I've actually, I actually even made a video about it. So with the Dectarin oral gel, um, in Australia, you don't need a script for it. So I write the name down on a, on a piece of paper and I give it to the patients and I tell them that they can, they can buy it from the pharmacy. Now, Dectarin oral gel here comes with a spoon. I tell them that the spoon is actually too much. All they really need to do is apply a pea-sized amount into their oral cavity. So depending on where I think the infection is the worst, I will tell them to put it on there. But generally, I always tell them to put it on the dorsal tongue because that's where the, it, Canada likes to hide. So I tell them to apply a pea-sized amount in there four times daily um, for about four weeks. Now, the official guidelines is that they should be doing it for seven to 14 days and then continue for another seven days after the infection has cleared up. Now, I don't know about you, but there are not many patients I know that can accurately identify when the infection is cleared up and continue for another seven days after. So just to ease, I usually tell them just do it for about four weeks. Now, when they put the gel in their mouth, I tell them to leave the, the gel in there for their mouth as long as possible. I tell them not to eat, drink or rinse or swallow for about 30 minutes after. So I generally tell no them... No swallowing for 30 minutes? How, how do they do that? So if you have like a little bit, you can, but I try to get them because some people would try to get rid of the gel taste and things like that. I'd be like, no, it should stay in there for as long as possible. A little bit of swallowing is fine, but they shouldn't like try and actively swallow all of the gel. So I explain should they it try to them. And get, should they keep their tongue out? Like should they try and keep stick their tongue out and leave it there or just, yeah, close their mouth? Okay. Yeah. So what I tell them to do is that, you know, when you wake up in the morning, have your breakfast, brush your teeth or whatever order you want to do that in, put a piece of in your mouth, put it, rub it around your oral cavity and then just go about your day. Don't worry about rinsing it out. Leave it alone for about 30 minutes and you should be fine. Now, sometimes you may have patients who do struggle with doing it four times a day, but I sort of explained to them that Canada is pretty good at hiding. You know, you need to keep using it long enough. You need to apply it often enough for it to actually work. And most patients are fairly compliant. Now, if they do have a denture, I tell them to put it to the fitting surface of the denture as well as a little bit on their tongue. And then at night when they sleep, because we've talked to them about denture hygiene already they take it out at night so they can just apply it directly into the oral cavity so that's typically so how just before you sleep it. is a is a good time to also apply it maybe that fourth time should be just before they sleep mm -hmm. yep so okay. dinner brush your teeth apply you can go to bed if you want and do other any studies looking at the efficacy of, of, of dactarian i mean how effective mm. is it in terms of as a medicine 
Yep. So Deck Tyrant Orijo is actually pretty good. So there are other ones that we can talk about, uh, which will include the fluconazole mouthwashes and the amphotericin B lozenges. Those ones are actually better for adults. But fluconazole mouthwashes in Australia has to be compounded. So that's quite a bit of an expense to get a compounded fluconazole mouthwash. Um, the amphotericin B is great. However, uh, so amphotericin B is a lozenge. So amphotericin B is called fungalin 10 milligrams and it comes in a little pastel that the patients suck on and they do that again four times a day. I usually tell them to do it for about four weeks. It can leave a bit of a yellow stain on the teeth but that's temporary that will come out. Amphotericin B is my choice if cost is not an issue because it's only covered partially here by the government. So in terms of cost, I, I generally will go to Dectar and Orange unless there's a reason for them to go to and for tourism B. The other thing as well, which sometimes patients don't, like it's obvious to us, but not really to the patient, they don't take their denture out when they're sucking the fungalin lozenge. So you have to make sure that they are happy to actually have their denture out when they're sucking it because the, the lozenge takes about 30 minutes to dissolve. So we, we all have our, you know, those patients who won't sleep without their dentures. Their partners have never seen them without their dentures. Sometimes it's a bit of a big ask to get them to take it out so often during the day. So in those cases, I'll just do Dectar and Oral Gel because they will be a little bit more compliant for it. Um, in infants, though, in studies, the Myconazole Oral Gel is actually shown to be the most effective. Mm-hmm. Is, is that a concern? Is, you know, you say we say that candida is a disease of a of the disease, and a child having it uh, and diagnosing it um, is that a reason for re- referral to a GP to get investigated for a child? I mean, I'm thinking like leukemia. I'm thinking things like that. It, or, or is it a common thing that it's not worth worrying about too much? I think it's worthwhile to treat first and see how they respond. If it's recurrent or coming very frequently, then definitely investigation is needed. But they used to call it the disease of the diseased, but we know that it happens in higher numbers in the very young and the very old as well. So I think if it's just a once-off or not happening too often, I, I don't think it's it's too bad. But if it keeps coming back, then it needs to be investigated. Okay. Any other medicines that you think are worth mentioning for GDPs? Like the, the fluconazole, you said is a, is a mouthwash, right? But it mm-hmm. has to be compounded. You mentioned that one already, so it's a bit trickier. If, if, are those all in terms of GDPs uh, needing to know? You can do fluconazole capsules. So you can give them 50 50 milligrams of fluconazole that they can swallow and they can do that for up to a week. I think if you're getting to the stage where giving them systemic fluconazole, I think that one you will have to do a little bit of reading up. Like I still think it's fine for general dentists to prescribe it, but obviously giving something systemic versus giving something topical, there will be more interactions. Actually, we need to talk about the interactions for for myconazole and I suppose for fluconazole as well. Mm, Let's, Let's do that. Mm. Because one of the things before you give the patient Dectar and Orojo, and this is the time where it is definitely worth spending going through their medical history with a fine tooth comb as well. So if they are on a statin, you need to be a little bit wary. And if they are on warfarin or even some of the, the, the newer anticoagulants, you have to be a bit wary as well. So myconazole can potentiate the action of warfarin. So patients can actually bleed a lot more. Even with the uh, the newer NOACs, so rivaroxaban also has that action. Sometimes there is a little bit of a concern in the hospital department if you need to treat the patient with a, you know, with, with an antifungal, are you able to give them myconazole or itraconazole or fluconazole or do you need to change them on their on their blood thinning medication? So I think that's something that needs to be uh, considered. Not to say that if I have a patient with warfarin, I will never put them on dectarin, but I think that's something that should be done at specialist level. So warfarin... Um, I think, yeah, as a, as a general dentist, I think as a rule of thumb, as a general dentist, mm. anything, that, anything that ends in azole, if they're at risk of bleeding or on, the, on that kind of medic- medication mm. that makes them bleed more, mm. or as you said, they're on a statin, is it a yeah. rule of thumb, say, avoid myconazole, avoid fluconazole? Yeah. And also probably your benzodiazepine because it can lead to long-lasting sedation. Okay. Mm. Mm. So those are probably the ones that I will avoid if the patients is is, um, if you want to put them on fluconazole or myconazole or the azoles, basically. And so maybe go for the nystatin suspension uh, in that case. I would probably go for the amphotericin B lozenges first because I think that they are still more they they are more effective. One of the big issues with Nilstat oral drops, if that's the formulation that's available to you, that there were a couple of studies done, um, and it's about 50% sugar. So they, this some patients can run into an issue. So say if they have salivary gland hypofunction, maybe they've had head and neck radiotherapy, they need to be on long-term antifungals and you, you give them nails that oral drops that they use every single day, they're going to get ring bark caries. You know, they, they're very high risk of dental caries. So generally on the whole, um, I would prefer amphotericin B rather than your nystatin oral drops.
Amazing. We're going to now do a segment of the podcast where it's going to be about roughly a minute long. So good luck. Okay. We're going to do, we're going to make an Instagram reel out of this. Okay. So uh, I'm going to get you to summarize everything you said. Okay. If the patient has this, you're going to prescribe my conazole, but be wary of this, this, this. Second choice is this, but then watch out for this. So try your best. Uh, it'll be a very fun uh, Instagram reel to make. So Amanda, over to you for the real guideline for GDPs prescribing antifungals. So this is not exhaustive. If a patient has oral candidosis, you can put them on Dectarin oral gel, otherwise known as myconazole oral gel. You do have to be careful if the patient's on a statin. You do have to be careful if the patient's on warfarin or rivaroxaban or if they are on a benzodiazepine. Second option, you can put them on fungalin 10 milligram lozenges, otherwise known as amphotericin B lozenges. You do have to be aware it can cause temporary staining and it's not safe in pregnancy. And also for denture wearers, they have to take off their denture. Yes, don't forget to reinforce denture hygiene and keep an eye out of any systemic contributors. And then third choice would be the nystatin. But generally, you think with the first two, the azoles uh, and the amphotericin B, Orleans, generally yeah. we're going to be okay. Yeah, I, I, would, I would put Neil step pretty low. Um, I don't know. Can you splice that together into a minute? I hope so. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, that, that was way shorter than a minute. That was perfect. Oh, very good. That was really good. That was you, 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 that was that was brilliant, uh, Amanda. Uh, I love straight talking guests like you. I, I I love guests like you who's like, there. This is what you need to know. Boom, boom, boom. You're like an encyclopedia of all medicine. I'm so glad uh, I've connected with you. This is amazing. So I guess the final part then. Uh, let's let's tell the GDPs about a, a common thing that I see. Well, I say common, but like you know, probably like in the scale of commonality, like more common than a dental trauma, like more common than a, a avulsion coming in, but but less common than a lot of the other things we see. So Ooh. angular and median rhomboid glossitis. What is the thinking, any difference in terms of what you explained so far when we're coming across these issues? Yeah. So first off, let's start with angular colitis because I think that's probably going to be the most common one that people see. If you see angular colitis, you need to consider why that has happened. So I think. Can you just describe for the student maybe what, what yes. it actually is? Yes, sorry. So angular colitis is usually crusting erythema or ulceration involving the bilateral commissures of the lip. So you can actually see that like, they usually have redness at the corner. Sometimes patients may describe it as a rash or an ulcer. Sometimes they may even tell you that they keep getting cold sores at the corner of their mouth, but what they're really describing is angular colitis. Mm. Does it so, always have to be bilateral? No, it can be unilateral as well. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. So angular colitis is something that we see fairly commonly. Um, I think one of the really great things for a dental professional to pick up is actually if there's loss of vertical dimension, have they had dentures for 20 years and is it about time to get them new dentures? But it is thought to be a polymicrobial infection. So the candidal species and also staph aureus and things like that have been thought to be associated. So first thing I would do is do all of the basic things that we talked about, about um, making sure that there's or identifying any obvious systemic contributors so you know checking you know are they anemic are they taking their denture out at night are they rinsing their mouth out after using a steroid puffer and then if all of that is maintained and you've optimized that well then you can get them to use a medication that they can apply to the side of their, their, their lips on the outside now there are a couple of ways to do this one of it is that if you suspect that they have an oral candidal infection as well as angular colitis you can actually try getting them to use something like the myconazole or dectarin oral gel. They can apply it to their tongue four times a day for four weeks that like we talked about. They can also put a little bit on the corners of their mouth and they can see if it clears up. Now, if it doesn't clear up, because it, sometimes, as I say, it could be polymicrobial and obviously the myconazole only works for a uh, fungal infection, you can apply something like canacoin, uh, which basically has a mild corticosteroid a antibiotic as well as an antifungal. So there are similar formulations where you can get these types of um, medications that have multipurpose and they can apply a little bit on the corner of their mouth. You can do clotrimazole as well, cream, um, which you can apply to the to the corner of the mouth. Now, I do want and to... These are all GDP friendly, you think? Or this is something that I we should be so. referring to, to you guys for? Okay. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I think I mean I think if you do suspect that an oral candidal infection, just starting off with the myconazole oral gel is probably the easiest. Sometimes if I do suspect that the patient has nasty or what I think is like, you know, not 
like the angular colitis is, is, is not going well, um, then I might get them to use myconazole oral gel in the mouth and put them on canacoin extra orally. But I think, you know, this is something that I think is fairly safe. But there is one word of caution that the patient shouldn't be using steroids on their skin for too long. So if you give them mm-hmm. canacoin, which has the antibiotic, the steroid and the antifungal, you want to make sure that they stop using it after a while because steroid can actually atrophy the skin. So it can actually make it a little bit worse. So for, so for if it's something like canacoin, I get them to do it um, two to three times a day for about two weeks and then once once it clears up you know i tell them make sure you stop don't keep applying a steroid on your skin because it can make things worse so that's generally how i would um approach the angular colitis medium rhomboid glossitis i would approach fairly similarly to how i would with the rest that we just talked about there you can they can apply um the dectarin oral gel into their oral cavity same as the denture stomatitis but probably one of the things to know about medium rhomboid glossitis and the denture stomatitis sometimes after treating them it may May not go away completely. So that little diamond-shaped erythema on the dorsal surface of the tongue may actually stay there even after you've treated the fungal infection. Another thing is that it's actually really common to get erythema of the heart palate based on a poorly fitting denture. So if you've treated the patient for an antifungal and the the surface of the heart palate still looks very red, you need to consider if the denture is rocking and causing trauma and causing erythema or if you've got something there that needs referral. Very good. Uh, I actually remember so random things you remember from dental school. <laughs> I remember Prof Nick Martin telling me that sometimes with a, a, a denture and you've got a patient who's got recurrent uh, denture stomatitis, that they may need the denture rebasing because apparently the candida actually goes into the acrylic, uh, is from my remember. That how is successful exactly. is oh right? So how successful is just myconazole and then it gets better with improved oral hygiene? Uh, or sometimes if it's uh, persistent, uh, such a thing as rebasing and or replacing the denture is that something that's uh, accepted? So the, um, the, the, the thing that I would like to bring up there is actually how you're giving your patient the denture hygiene instructions. Because you may, like in Australia here, there was a little bit of discussion around the fact whether when the denture is removed at night, whether it should be kept in water or whether it should be kept dry. Because some people argue that taking it out and leaving it dry at night will change the dimensional stability of the acrylic. And I think someone then published a paper and said that it was very minimal. So what I tell my patients to do when they take their dentures out at night is to give it a good clean not to use toothpaste because it scratches the acrylic and gives more areas for the uh, candida to colonize but to use something like dish soap and a very soft brush give it a really good clean rinse it leave it dry overnight now in most cases by leaving it dry overnight you should be able to reduce colonization of the candida by that and then also don't forget you're also applying like the myconazole oral gel directly onto the denture itself now in some cases if the patient is due for a new denture it's poorly fitting it's not up to par then I think replacing the denture or relining the denture if it rocks or if it doesn't fit well, I think is is just is perfectly justifiable. Amazing! Wow, uh, it's over forty minute mark, and you've literally blasted antifungals and all those things. Uh, I'm so happy. Uh, I think everyone's going to love this. I think the protrusoranti chopping onions right now uh, are going to feel much more confident now about diagnosing and managing uh, uh, fungal infections uh, of the oral cavity. Is there anything else that you think we need to noteworthy for the general dentists who are uh, tuning in either on YouTube or the app or listening in on Spotify? No, I think we've we've covered oral candida quite well. I mean, there are some things that are out there right now about emerging resistance of bacteria and fungus to the medications that we do use. So if something feels a little bit funny, if it's not if it's not going well, if it doesn't heal right or it keeps recurring, then I think that's definitely um, a good thing to consider referring. Um, I think this is also dependent on your uh, where you are, but I think getting to know your local oral medicine specialist is actually a good idea as well because I think it's very common and I certainly felt it when I was when, when I was a dentist as well you don't know whether these cases need referral or not so if you are friendly with your local specialist you know you can open up the doors to conversation you can ask them hey I've got this patient do you need to see them and I think in most cases if it's something that we feel that is very that is completely fine for a dentist to manage we we, we will talk you through it so i think um you know dentistry is all about community so make connections and get to know your local specialist too
Yeah, uh, there's a, a shortage of, of, of I don't know, I, I feel there's a shortage. They're, they're, they're few and far between. So it's good to find these guys and uh, be able to lean on them for advice and guidance. And I think you have provided so much uh, advice and guidance in just a, a clear manner. So thank you so much. Uh, where can we learn more from you? Uh, what are your channels to follow you on and to absorb all this wonderful, uh, helpful content that you're generating so we can help our patients? That's, ultimately, that's what it's about. How can we serve our patients in a predictable manner? How can we learn more from you, Amanda? Oh, Thank you very much. So I do have an Instagram page that's called uh, Oral Medicine Oral Pathology. And then on Facebook, it's a spoonful of oral medicine. So I'm the same as you. I, I do love, you know, talking and educating. So I do put up a few posts on things that I think people will, or hopefully people will find helpful. I can vouch for it. Um, when, I, when I saw your page, I was like, yes, this is what I want. Come on, Protrusive, to talk about all these things, oral medicine. So, I, I mean, thank you so much. I will have to invite you back because I loved it so much. It was so direct. One of my, my, my team often work together and we make these infographics and stuff so uh, I'll be able to short se- uh, send it to you for you to get your seal of approval so you can share it with everyone it'll be a nice summary for everyone because there's a lot to grasp but if you can if you can make it into an infographic which you will it'll be really nice for them to follow and that'll be yours because that's your work base in your um, um, delivery of the content and I look forward to making that real and sharing it as well so uh, oh, Amanda thank, thank you so you. much for giving up your time today I really appreciate it oh not a problem thank you for having me I had a really good time well, there we have it, guys. Straight Talking Amanda did a fantastic job at breaking down. I think that's it, right? We've absolutely smashed antifungals. You know what to prescribe now. And you'll have the infographic, which you'll download, of course. And if you're a Protrusive Premium member, you don't need to download anything. You, need to sign, you don't need to sign up for anything. You just head over to the app, the Protrusive Vault section, where you'll find hundreds of PDFs and goodies. And, of course, you've got a premium monthly content, which I'm adding to, and we're loving it. And, uh, of course, now that OBAB, my occlusion course, is published, and I'm not having to dedicate my entire life to that occlusion project i can feed the app a lot more now so thanks so much for sticking with me but the best is yet to come and thank you for listening all the way to the end i'll catch you in the next episode